Hello, MPIBC. Remember me? It's Anthony Vay from the Event Design Collective. I'm excited to be here today to moderate our Master Series Education event. But importantly, this is also the AGM for MPI British Columbia's chapter, um, which will be conducted by Chapter President David Takanen after the event. So MTI BC members will remember to stay online after the panel conversation uh, to take part in the AGM and of course meet your new board. My BC friends, can you believe it's been three years since we parted ways? I've missed our occasional visits. Uh, yes, I am still here in Toronto. And today we have guests joining us from LA and Vancouver, a technical feat that will become even more commonplace in the very near future. How do we do this? Well, we will tell you that after the first panel. So do us a favor and please keep the chat feed uh, free of any technical questions until we get to that panel section of the uh, session. Today, we have a true master series conversation. In Vancouver, we're joined by Catherine and Janet McCartney, longtime industry leaders and, and former producers of the TED conference. From sunny Los Angeles, we have the founder of Dynamo Events, Chrissy Thompson. As I teased, after we talk design and production with the ladies, we are going to hear from Peter Young from Hubcast Media International and Daniel Sabina from Showmax Events. Of course, MPI BC events would not happen without our incredible sponsors and I'm very happy to see many of the same names that were involved back when I was the VP of Partnerships and Advertising for the chapter. Of course, they are Meeting Prince George, Loungeworks, Helijet, Effective Consulting, Spets Association Management, Foster Walker Gifts of Distinction, NASCO Staffing Solutions, EPLY, My Badges, John Benjamin Photography, and Vision Event Photography. I want to welcome all the members from the BC chapter and other MPI chapters tuning in from further and abroad. Welcome to the members from ILEA Vancouver, PCMA Canada West, and the Fraser Valley Event Planning Association. And if you don't fall into one of those categories, there's no better time to sign up with an association than right now. They are here to support you in the hard times like we're going through. I look forward to all of you engaging with us and contributing to the conversation. Capture your experience and share it on social media using hashtag MPIBC meets. And why don't we get ahead of the curve and start using hashtag GMID 2021, hashtag GMID meet safe, and hashtag meetings mean business. There's a lot of great conversations coming up next month and why don't we get ahead of that curve? Oh, just think about it, I almost forgot someone. Yeah, you, 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 I'm looking at you. You're watching this on demand after the fact. We don't care what your excuses were for missing the live webcast. You're still welcome. But now it's even more important that you share your experience on social media. Otherwise, we won't know that you were ever here. Okay. I think that is enough time-wasted pandering to the audience. We stole the line for this event from the Strattons and Unmarketing. Everything has changed but nothing is different. As much as our world has been disrupted, many of the old factors and elements stay the same and are equally hard to navigate. In the Event Design Collective, we analyze and manage braiding points of experience. The first one we will explore today is the idea that in ourselves and in our audiences, we are constantly blending past experiences with our hopes and aspirations for what the future may hold. Now, I know that sounds pretty complex, but stick with me, we'll get through this. Let's meet our first panel of experts as we attempt to braid our understanding of the past with the reality of the present so that we can design the future on our immediate horizon. Janet McCartney is the founder and principal of PDW Inc., one of the largest event production companies in North America. They're situated in Vancouver, Canada, where they have crafted and led teams designed to produce and manage complex multi-level projects and internationally award-winning events for a diverse range of organizations. She served on the leadership team as the director of TED conferences and has directed the growth, design, and development of over 60 annual TED conferences since 2002, supporting their mission to provide a platform for spreading ideas to everyone free of charge mm -hmm. and creating impact in some of the most pressing challenges of our time. Janet started her career in, the tourism, in tourism marketing, where she managed a highly successful tourism marketing team for Expo 86. 
She developed the brand marketing for Tourism Vancouver, established Jasper and Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge in the international ski markets, solidifying the viability for the resorts to operate year round. Wow, really She's weird. been on several successful bid committees and operations committees for the tourism industry conferences and has produced over 500 events. Animal welfare, conservation, and the environment have been her North Star, leading her to parallel work protecting and improving the lives of all species in their natural habitat, driving change forward to elevate conversations that recognize human behavior and how our actions affect the lives of other species. Truly, one of the most pressing issues of our time. Welcome, Janet. Catherine is a business event professional and leader in the hospitality industry. Known for her attention to detail and strong focus, her pursuit of excellence drives her daily work practice. She is most widely recognized for her 18 years as the producer of the TED Conference, which earned her the Business Event Canada Global Vision Award and Tourism Vancouver's Harold J. Merrilies Award. In 2015, the company she co-founded, Vancouver-based PDW Inc., was awarded Event Solutions Spotlight Award International Event Company of the Year, among other awards. Before opening her own business, her event resume included working for Maritz, London, IETO, SunQuest Incentives, and Rare Indigo. While running the European Marketing Division of Tourism British Columbia for 11 years, she co-created Canada, Canada's West Marketplace, a thriving reverse marketplace platform where Canadian sellers meet global selection of buyers, currently in its 30th year, and focused on developing BC's off-season to international buyers. She enjoys time with friends, reading, photography, and illustrations. So please join me in welcoming Catherine. Joining us from LA is Chrissy Thompson, the founder of Dynamo Events, a Los Angeles-based event planning and management firm dedicated to helping high-growth technology companies produce events that spark business. Founded in 2016, Dynamo has planned business events online in over 30 cities and on four continents, serving over 2,500 attendees for some of the most innovative tech brands in the world, including On24, G2 Crowd, Iterable, Cordial, and uh, social, social Native, to name but a few. Chrissy was named one of Connect Magazine's 40 Under 40 in 2017 and is known for being a master event strategist, hotel site selection enthusiast, and financial modeling fanatic. She's also a certified digital event strategist. So Chrissy, we're gonna to have to talk about getting you your certified event designer title as well because DES and CED go beautifully together. At home, she can be found mixing a craft cocktail or lifting heavy weights, but not at the same time. When I first read that bio, I thought, how big are your martini glasses, Chrissy? Welcome. <laughs> so, Thanks. Should, should we jump straight into this? Should we uh, get, get these questions rolling and let's take a look at the past and see how we can braid that together with our expectations for the future? But to set the stage, Catherine, I would like to start with you. For the few members of the audience who are not familiar with your work, and yes, I feel a bit crazy saying that, can you give us a bit of the history uh, on how your relationship with TED started and how the journey evolved over the years? Absolutely. First, I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's great to be with you all today. And um, I think that the story of uh, the affiliation with TED is one of persistence, timing, and luck. I met Chris Anderson, the current owner of TED, when I was project managing a private party for him over the Y2K millennium, where he was going to host 150 family and friends here in British Columbia in Whistler. And um, so I was project managing that for him. And the event went on after it was completed to win national and international awards. So it was super successful. And it was recognized by both the industry and the client. So a year later, I uh, was down in San Francisco and I called on him uh, to sort of just rehash and discuss what had happened and um, say hello. And I predicted at that time to him that we would work again in the future. And he laughed and he looked at me because I had no understanding of how that would happen or when that would happen. But I felt very strongly it would happen. 
So fast forward, he buys the TED conference. I learn of that, and I give him a call, and I say, I'd like to produce the TED conference for you. And uh, he hadn't put an operational plan in place, and so he invited me to meet with him in person, and I did that. And I ended up spending my Christmas writing a proposal. How many of you can relate to that? Um, Ted stole so many Christmases from me over the years. But I put in a proposal, and I got the nod in early um, January 2002. And at that point, it began a very lofty 18 years of producing about 60 conferences for TED. Um, uh, so from the very beginning, Chris was very clear on one thing. He wanted to take the ideas that were being presented on stage and democratize them. There were a thousand people at the conference watching these talks, but he wanted to find a way to spread that. So he purchased the conference with a nonprofit, and we went to, to work. In 2003, the first conference was held in Monterey, California, and I think that we had about 650 people attending. We had five staff and 20 volunteers produce that conference. So um, that was the beginning of the journey. By 2005, we'd added a global conference, and in 2006, an important step was taken. After trying, to get TV stations to put the talks into a TV format and failing at that, Chris put three talks online and it bore, it was the birth of TED.com. So that was 2006. In 2009, we launched the TEDx brand where we had so many individuals, mayors and cities asking us to produce a conference in their country and we really didn't have the bandwidth to do that. And so the TEDx brand was launched, licensees were now able to apply and produce their one day event and we would harvest the talks and put them on TED.com. In 2010, TED Women was born and um, in our banner year, which was 2009, we produced four major conferences out of the Vancouver office on three continents. I think it nearly killed us, but we had about 55 staff. And um, at the same time in 2009, the TED staff was about 150. So a couple of hundred people, and we had all these unique divisions within TED.com. It was growing, it was mushrooming. We were becoming more well-known as TED.com was getting those talks out to the many rather than the few. And, um, and so that began that journey. Um, each year, our attendees expected us to innovate. They expected us to do bigger and better. And we ended up, of course, um, uh, moving the conference as a result. Uh, our Vancouver team, uh, and certainly Janet and I, attended all the TED staff retreats. We were treated as part of the TED team, even though we had our own company. And I've heard um, many people say, oh, they liken TED to Facebook and to Google. And you know that those companies have masses of offices and huge teams, and Ted still, is, I don't know the exact number today, but it's about 300 staff making all that noise and making all of that brand happen. Um, and so in 2018, we made the decision to sell our assets to Ted. Um, and I don't want to speak on behalf of Janet, but certainly we were tired. It had been 18 years, um, and I think... I personally was ready for a new chapter in my life. Um, you know, you help grow an iconic brand such as TED, and you make a lot of ch choices that are in service to the brand and to the client. And it's his company, it's not our company. And so trying to regain a sense of self and continue my own journey was important to me. And I think that I can say, you know, we haven't looked back. It was a really... Um, 
happy outcome at the end of 18 years. And of course, we've continued as consultants and contractors to TED, although um, during the pandemic, they haven't had any live events either. Um, but it was also an opportunity to hand over the reins to a younger generation and see where they can take the brand. Amazing. Uh, there's so much to unpack there. Uh, and, and I think we will explore some of that in the ongoing conversation, so I won't hit you with too many questions right now. But I will say at this point, um, I would like to thank you uh, and Janet for that matter. Uh, I, I've been a TED fanatic for years, uh, so, so thank you. And to anybody else who's watching who's worked with, with Catherine and Janet over the years to produce TED, uh, the content's amazing and, and you, I think it has made a big difference in the world. Comparing it to the other big tech companies, is a bit different because I think the do no evil element uh, and doing the good and, and, and pushing these conversations forward has been an amazing thing that Ted's created and thank you for your contributions to that. Um, okay, so let's look at this then. Let's, um, event professionals are pretty understandably uh, under pressure at the moment with hybrid on the doorstep. Uh, and top of mind is balancing the experience journey over multiple modes of delivery, you know, the in-person, the digital, the on-demand, and those elements. As intimidating as this can seem, it's not as new as most event professionals think. We only need to look at ancillary industries like live sports and esports for the more modern. Uh, and they've been living in a hybrid design mindset since the birth of broadcast television, uh, gaming consoles, and the internet. As distant as these connections to those industries may seem, um, it, there are innovators in the industry, and I think there's no, no better, more impressive than, than how TED approached their live and digital ecosystems. Janet, can, can you give us a bit of an insight into how you approach the balance between the in-person audience's needs and the remote audience and post viewing through the uh, YouTube, TED channel, the various different mechanisms for delivery. Did you design the experiences differently? And how did you apply the right focus in the right areas at the right time? Right. Well, the remote audience was always a big part of our events because we were in the lucky position where our demand exceeded our supply for the live event. Together with the high ticket price, which gave us the opportunity to create more affordable options for others. Our intent was always to spread the talks as far and as wide as possible. So from a technical point of view, our camera and audio systems were designed to capture the talks for best presentation for the live in-house audience, but also capture whatever we needed for all the other formats we'd need in post. The editors provided input in the early years to help us identify what camera angles would work best in the streaming formats and what things we might have missed in the first couple of years. But an important part of every TED conference has always been our simulcast lounges, where we essentially had our own remote audience right at the event. So the nature of the audience required us to provide flexible options. For example, you couldn't use your computer in the theater. Um, or any kind of screen. There were people that needed to be um, online with their offices or whatever. So we designed all of these simulcast spaces so that they had ultimate flexibility. And that also allowed us to sell more tickets than we had theater seats because we had all of those other options to provide on site to watch. We had several remote streaming audiences at TED as well as an entire simulcast only conference called TED Active. And that simulcast only conference was a thousand people in a different destination. So we held, we built an entire community around that specific event, which was held in Aspen, Palm Springs, Whistler. They had their own full event program, their own evening events, and all the aspects of a TED event and even a few live speakers. We also had TEDx events, which were not produced by us, but we worked with that TEDx community to get as many of those ancillary events happening where at, they were produced by their own licensees and their own teams, and they streamed our event to their event. We also maintained a rigorous schedule to put our talks up as they were done live to TED.com throughout the conference. So our editors worked into the wee hours so we could post a few as quickly as possible. And then we had TED Live, which was a program where for a nominal fee, you could create your own mini streaming event 
for you and your friends to stream the sessions live. With the TED Archive is the online library of previously unpublished talks from the TED conferences, which are available on YouTube, but also all of the TED talks that are up online on TED.com are also available on YouTube and all the other plethora of distribution channels out there. There's an entire WE department at TED who's responsible for the, just the distribution of the talks. So all of those formats had to be considered when we were designing our technical systems. Yeah, we amazing. Also had, really, sorry. Sorry. sorry keep going. I was just going to say we also had a secondary theater, uh, which was the theater that I produced, and it started out as a as a forum for our attending audience to be able to give a talk themselves because so many of our speakers who were once a speaker then became an audience member. And so many of our audience members were really interesting people in their own right and had something to tell us and teach us. So we created this second format of the community theater and um, that theater actually drove a lot of the change of the talks over the years where primarily we still do have a lot of 18 minute talks on the main stage but because my theater was producing three to nine or even 15 minute talks uh, that short format became a driving force in the company for all of the other formats that they were producing from then on. Amazing stuff. Uh, so so ahead of its time. I think there's so much that uh, especially meeting professionals can unpack from that. Uh, and, and we will dig a bit more into those uh, with some follow-up questions coming up. But I think now's a perfect time to bring in Chrissy. Um, Chrissy, you, you've been very busy with online events and you've been closely connected to the tech world, uh, in particular with user conferences navigating multiple modes of delivery as well. Can you do, discuss your approach to designing experiences for online, live and on-demand audiences? Definitely, yeah, and just, just to start off, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity as well. It seems um, like kind of like a little dream to be sitting virtually alongside two uh, industry titans in Janet and Catherine. The measuring stick that we usually have for uh, the keynote speakers that we're sourcing for our clients is, have they done a TED Talk? And then we kind of use that as our uh, reference point as we're evaluating. So it's pretty cool to be sitting um, with you two and you, Anthony, as well. Um, but to answer your question, Anthony, um, talking about content delivery for user conferences in particular and, and thinking through the strategy there, um, you know, I think it's probably good to talk about the context of the types of events that we're working on. User conferences in particular tend to be our kind of flagship type of event that we work on for clients. Um, so these are brands, usually in the technology industry, who are hoping to bring together their customers for education, networking, um, you know, and the brand that's putting the event on, they're hoping to sell more software, right? So um, they are hoping to increase renewals, expand uh, existing deals, and uh, accelerate any deals that might be pretty far down the pipeline. Um, so they're definitely coming from a very you know, specific business goal. And then their attendees are attending the event with the hopes to uh, you know, learn what others are doing with the product, how can they get more value out of the product that they've already made an investment in, or if they're considering making a purchase, um, going and speaking to current customers and hearing about their experiences so that they can make a more informed decision. Um, so I think it's good to always just set the stage with the goal of both the uh, the event host and the attendee, because obviously we always want to be thinking about those things as we then go build out the, the content strategy and delivery. So with that said, I would say previously with live experiences, we were really honestly very focused, uh, let's be honest, only focused on the, the live experience prior to COVID. Um, and that's it's interesting. I mean, our, one of our, our main events that we work on is called Webinar World, but strategically it made sense um, that we were very focused on the live event content and experience and then crafting that in a way that we knew that the client would be able to then use all of that content throughout the year and kind of slice and dice it and make it evergreen throughout the year um, for the different types of audiences that who, who would be consuming that content for the rest of the year. So really putting a lot into the production of those pieces of content 
at the conference and then kind of setting them up for the rest of the year so that they had content to use for the whole next year until they had the annual event again the next year. Um, so that was definitely the, the focus previously. Um, and then now that we've been doing only live events, or sorry, online events uh, since then, I would say that it's, we've definitely had a lot of learnings in terms of the, uh, the content strategy of how to format the programming. So certainly we've all learned that shorter events as well as shorter sessions are definitely getting greater engagement in the online world. Um, I don't think anyone's surprised by that, but what's interesting is we were kind of saying that that was something to experiment with prior to um, the pandemic hitting with live events as well. So I do think that that's one thing that um, sort of was rumbling, at least within the, in the events industry, I feel like we were, we were saying that, you know, we should experiment with shorter sessions, bite-sized content, um, stuff like that. So uh, I think that we've kind of learned from the pandemic that uh, that might be something that we want to incorporate more into live experiences when we go back as well. Um, and so that's something that we're definitely thinking through with our clients as we think about bringing in-person meetings back. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention here was that I would encourage, and, and Anthony, you, you spoke about this earlier, that there's kind of this nervousness, nervousness around going hybrid and that there's like a little fear around how are we going to be able to pull this off. Um, I think we've all learned in the past year how much goes into creating a full-blown you know, online experience, an online conference. Um, if, if we didn't know before, now we definitely know. And then we already had the experience of knowing how much goes into creating a live event, a live conference. And so thinking about the future, we're like, oh, I don't know if I can handle uh, doing, doing a full-blown version of both of those in the future. So what I would just encourage everyone to do is really think through those, those goals of both the, the host, of whoever's hosting the event and the attendee still, um, and just make sure that you're crafting the experience around those goals still. So I'll take the user conference as an example. I don't actually think that you need to do a full-blown digital experience for your user conference going forward. I think that there's gonna be a much more scaled back version that would make sense. And the reason is, um, like I was saying before, the people who are going to your in-person conference, that's a very different person um, with their relationship to your brand. If they're willing to get on a plane and spend three days with you in Vegas or San Francisco or Los Angeles, um, you know, they're at a very different place with your brand than someone who isn't willing to get on a plane and um, you know, it would rather watch from home. So they need different types of content uh, based on where they are in the buyer's journey as well as um, the way that they're consuming the content. So just think through that and don't be so... Uh, don't be so scared about the, the fact that we're going to hybrid because I don't think it's going to be as uh, huge <laughs> in terms of the, the production on both sides. I think there's going to be a happy medium. So, um, And the last thing I'll say about that actually is don't forget to survey your audience. This is one of those things that's, you know, like you were saying, the theme of the event, that everything is changed but nothing is different you got to talk to your audience and ask them what they're looking for. Um, and then that will help you understand how much you need to put into the content delivery for digital versus um, in person. So always remember to survey. Fantastic stuff. Uh, what, what I took away from, uh, from, from, from those three last sections uh, really is not only were you approaching your content and curating that content as appropriate for the means of receiving it, uh, but to a certain extent, you're also curating your audience and understanding how your audience fits into the scheme, not only in that one moment, in that one event, but in the full lifespan of the event and the experience journey either side of it. So really, really fascinating stuff that we may dig a bit deeper into if we have time. But I want to get back to that idea of braiding the past with the present and what our future may be. And the next hottest topic that keeps turning up for virtual and hybrid is how to approach ticketing and revenue streams. Once again, I'm going to encourage the viewers to look at ancillary industries like uh, live sports and entertainment. If you've ever bought a fan package or a meet and greet, you've been experiencing alternative uh, ticketing and revenue streams. Not sure many of them were COVID proof, but it's a simple example nonetheless. 
I also think that the way that TED approached their revenue models, and we kind of hinted at that early on, was very innovative in its time, certainly even now in today. Catherine, how did you approach the ticketing for the main event and some of those other ancillary events that were mentioned earlier? Can meeting profs learn anything from the business models that you've applied over the years, some of your wins, uh, some of your successes? I think so. Uh, we, like any other conference, you revisit your revenue stream with every budget that you produce, but we didn't actually make increases to registration fees every year. We inherited a conference. It started at 6000 bucks. It had one main theater and a simulcast lounge, and whoever got registered first got the main stage tickets, and whoever got in after that got simulcast. Um, we moved to a model where uh, we actually charged a bit more for main stage. It was an unpopular model, and so over the course of the five years, we ended up saying, okay, we've got a 1,000 people on a, on a wait list, we're gonna have to move, and we ended up moving the conference this time after visiting a 1,000 cities on paper and narrowing it down to 26, we chose Long Beach. Long Beach had 3,000 seats. We were going from 495 to 3,000. The world was our oyster. Um, it had a second theater, it had an arena, an outdoor terrace, lobby spaces galore for simulcast lounges, and it allowed us the opportunity to look at the model that we had and say, where are we going to take this? So we developed a three-tier system where we had a regular pass, and we bumped that up to 7,500 with the move, and you could be a donor. You could pay double. And so you'd pay $15,000 to become a donor, or you could become a patron and attend for five years for the price of $125,000 US. This is an important point. TED is a nonprofit. It is a 5013 status in the United States. And working with our auditors and our accounting firms, we were able to determine that the fair market value of attending a conference was $2,500 US which meant that we could issue tax receipts for the difference between 2500 and the price that they paid. So if you paid 125, you were actually getting a tax receipt for $122,500. That allowed people to actually blend into their annual giving campaign the cost of registration. And they were sold into the idea in their own minds of being able to contribute to the greater good of getting the talks out to the many for free. And so that was how we developed that. Now, of course, fast forward a few years, costs are rising because we're innovating and changing things and more cameras and bigger sets and all the rest of it. And so we had to introduce another cost, what I can t uh, another increase. And what I can tell you is it is super important to have a very defendable uh, language around price increases because you're going to get questions and you need to be able to tell your community why the increases are occurring. So that's a super important part. Um, as far as the ancillary audiences are concerned, we developed uh, TED Live and we attached a price to tag to that, which was super affordable. And the whole vision behind TED Live was that you could just buy a pass, get the stream, which meant that you and your friends could share that cost and watch a week of talks at somebody's home and enjoy it together. So we were trying to come up with innovative, inexpensive options for people to attend. TEDx, of course, had their own pricing model attached to their ancillary events. And with TED Active, we came up with a much lower price tag to attend the simulcast only event. Um, and so where are we now? Uh, what I will say is certainly the venue that we chose helped determine the revenue model 
And while I was going through destination options, I had multiple mathematical formulas in my head and running them as to the revenue bottom line, etc. Like every aspect had to be considered at the beginning. And I always use that line and say that you have to, you have to know the end at the beginning and be working towards that. Um, last week, Ted launched a new program and it's Ted membership. So what they did was that for anybody who has attended a conference, they launched Ted membership and you can buy in at $50 US for the year. Now, what does that get you? It actually gets you um, participation in off the record, ask me anything, uh, presentations with favorite TED speakers. That's one thing it gets you. It gets you TED Circles. Now, TED Circles was launched a number of years ago, and the, and the fastest way for me to explain what that is is Clubhouse. Okay, so and if you look at that new phenomenon that is happening with Clubhouse, um, TED Circles is when the community members sign up for a conversation, which is a digital, could be a Zoom conversation, um, and you participate as a small group. Uh, and so it's scheduled in advance. It is sign up like Clubhouse is, and you can drop in. And so it gets you that. It also gets you to be part of new speakers that are TED speakers and uh, Q&A sessions. And so TED's trying to hang on to their community just like everybody else. They've been hit by the pandemic. Everything has changed. And um, they've introduced this new mo membership. You have to remember that the TED's style of, of speaking and, and speaker presentations has been adopted by a lot of conferences. Um, and that's all good. Um, in addition to that, TED.com, when it was launched in 2006, there wasn't a lot of competition for that. Now everybody's a curator, everybody's a host, and there are umpteen podcast series all vying for that small window of your time that you dedicate a day or a week to learning an online education. And so um, Ted has to be innovative in these days as well. The, uh, you know, we, we all want live conferences back. Pricing digital against live is a completely different thing. Um, I do think that uh, there will be hybrid and it will be very important to price those two things in several different package options, I think, to gain the most momentum and give people choices. Love it. I especially love your point about knowing the end goal in mind and having having connection with with the venues and elements like that. I, I think what, what you've done so masterfully there is is uh, taking advantage of the idea of zooming in and zooming out your perspective. So what does this mean for this year in this time and place that I'm in? What do I, and the different things that circle around it. But then if I zoom out far enough, what is this gonna mean in five years time? What are the choices I make now in the design elements? How does that feed the iterative changes that you're gonna create? And uh, that's really inspirational. And I think how you've broken down over the years, those incremental changes can be taken by these, uh, but by meeting profs as well to look at, okay, yes, we're making a shift here, but this is the first step in many changes that, that are going to come and to keep chipping away at them and have that broad perspective, not too zoomed in that you can't see the future enough, but not too zoomed out that you miss the opportunities that exist in the now. I think that, that's really inspirational, really interesting stuff. Let's hit another one, uh, another topic top of mind for virtual and hybrid uh, and, and event owner challenges in general sponsorship and advertising. Um, we know that there are analytical benefits to digital. We can track where people go on the platform within the space and provide good data back to the sponsors. However, as we so often find, it is the human that we relate to, not the computer. Our human behavioral challenges are stronger than ever, I would argue, in this new world of sponsor and brand uh, activation. Janet, can you give us some insight into sponsor relations and brand activations? You've seen this from multiple perspectives, uh, I, I think, with the work you've done for destinations as well. Um, if I can ask you to postulate, and I realize that's a risky thing to undertake, 
how were these relationships structured in the past and how many things change as we move into this digital first mindset? Do you have any concerns or is there any excitement for what's on the horizon based on what you've learned from the past? Well, looking backwards, the, the sponsors at TED really changed the event experience in ways that dramatically affected the way the community experienced the conference. Before them, which was probably for about the first four or five years, we didn't have as many large sponsorships. And the experience was mainly the stage talks, some simulcast seats in the lobby areas that we complemented with some exhibits, our evening events. The meal program at TED was always legendary because we activated during those times as well, the breaks, the lunches, and the evening events. And then we had a late night program. When the partners started to come on board, our strategy allowed them to build out those simulcast spaces with their own design teams, which resulted in highly designed spaces that competed with each other and complemented one another. Together, they amped up the overall experience in orders of magnitude that exceeded anything we could have done with our own budget. Not unusual, but we had the best creative minds through their design houses, their agencies, working on those spaces. And the partners were spending as much on their builds in some case as on their actual partnership. I think about the sci-fi space in Long Beach, which was one of my favorite spaces ever. And although it's difficult to find partners who make those type of investments today for the same opportunity, they were inspirational, and they created a destination within a destination. You would literally allocate a break or a day to go investigate one space and then move on to the next one. Our partners directed their activations to our live in-house audience and needed a clever way to get to them. And this is when we saw partners starting to incorporate social justice and bigger societal causes into their activations. That was 15 years ago. They made the entire experience that much more important as social justice has always been at the heart of the TED brand and at, at the heart of Chris's heart since he purchased it in 2002. Catherine and I worked collaboratively with the head of global partnerships who, to develop strategies and a product plan each year for the partner team to sell. As they identified partners throughout the year, we worked in tandem to create other opportunities. In fact, it was our team that put together all the sales decks that they would then bring back to the partners. As they identified partners throughout the year, we very often knew products that Catherine and I created for the event that were independent of the partner team, from exhibits to pre-conference experiences, eventually become monetized by one of the partners who fell in love with that new program element. The partner team looked to Catherine and I to, uh, to identify opportunities, not that this is abnormal for the operations team to be involved, but the level of partnerships that we were bringing in and the innovation of their activations required a strong degree of thinking outside of the box and collaboration every step of the way. The theme of the conference was different each year, which helped partners define their own approach creatively, but what was paramount to the success of our partner program was having our entire operations team together with the other department heads working collaboratively to ensure everyone understood who is looking at coming on board, who is on board already, what products each partner wanted to showcase, and we worked hand in glove to ideate and fulfill those. When I look into the future, it's a different landscape for remote events, to be sure. Companies old and new are developing their own social, social justice platforms as a matter of course. Advertisers and partners need to get their messages out in 30 second or shorter sound bites to keep anyone's attention. The ability to get their messages across in digital format is more to the point. One I recently experienced was a training program where the partners followed each online module with a couple of pages featuring the products that directly tied into the training subject and focused only on that one project. So it was very specific, and I read every single one of them, which is a lot for me because, uh, you know, I, like everyone else, want to get through things quickly. But it was very relevant, and it was very clever the way that it was done. 
not unlike what we were doing in a live event, but direct and to the point. Um, I, th I think that the days of the hard sell are coming to a close as people want to purchase from companies who are aligned with their value system. At an event, it is no longer about giving away free products, but showing how the products will make a difference to the individual, to the community, to the industry, to the world. And I, one of the things that I see opportunities looking into the future is um, when we look at national, national history, national companies who... Sorry, we're getting a handheld. Yep, we've got a bit of a microphone challenge there. <laughs> I see... I see companies who, um, can you hear me well? I see yeah, companies who um, are national in scope, and those companies are actually perfect for Zoom type or remote type meetings, where you can actually, it's almost like a treasure trove for them to be able to test their products with a national uh, community uh, simultaneously at the same time in the comfort of their own homes. So being very creative about the type of people that you go after and how you activate with them is offering all sorts of new opportunities to uh, people who are producing remote events. And I also think about things like our, you know, our, for example, we had a partner who um, used to um, sponsor one of our programs called Speed Dating, where we had everybody meet each other in five minute interviews with each other and it was an opportunity to meet one on one and get to know the community better and make new friends. That is such an easy thing to translate into a remote format and just coming up with what are the rules and the guidelines that's going to make that compelling and, and successful. So I think that there's all sorts of new ways of looking at old pieces of the program and making it um, work for a remote event. Fantastic. Uh, you, you have absolutely warmed my heart. There were some words used in there like collaboration. And I love the level of engagement that you had with all the contributors, uh, really how you, how you fostered co-creation in, in, in all the experiences as well. Uh, it, can, it can be daunting to be the person responsible for bringing all those players together and getting them to articulate their needs and their wants. Uh, and, and what you've shared sort of shows a great example of how that can be really successful. Uh, Chrissy, I would love to hear your perspective regarding sponsor relations. Um, for those watching in other regions, Dynamo creates highly branded, polished experiences. And what have you taken away from uh, creating branded in-person events into the digital world? And if I can challenge you, is there anything from the digital world that you're going to bring back as we head to in-person events again? Yes, so I'll preface this by saying, obviously I'm, we're working on, again, different types of events than, uh, than the TED conferences in that they're, well, first of all, a lot smaller, so maybe 1,000 people max or up to 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 now that they're online, but in person, um, much smaller and working with kind of mid-stage startups who are, um, maybe this is their first, second, or third user conference that they're uh, hosting. So their sponsors are all pretty much similar to them. Um, and so it's we're doing a lot of educating with them on um, what would make sense to, um, you know, to do in terms of sponsorships for their user conferences. Um, their, their partners are going to be solutions that um, work hand in hand with whatever their solution is. So um, a lot of the times, you know, for these types of events, they'll we'll do a demo hall type of thing. Um, but kind of in terms of creating the the polished branded experience, we'll if it is in a kind of public area, we will will be responsible for creating the actual graphics for the demo booths, and they're just responsible for providing a logo and maybe a couple key takeaways they want to include on their booth. Um, but that way, we're able to still make it feel cohesive with the rest of the conference branding. Um, but they're still able to get their mes message across. That said, we've definitely in the past um, wanted to try and get more creative with how we're putting together those sponsorships because um, there is kind of a vibe within, at least within the, the tech user conference community that it's like the attendees don't want to get sold to, right? 
So just creating opportunities for the sponsors to get more involved with the programming itself or um, just creatively, creatively incorporating them. Um, I think like Janet was saying, like um, having them host the speed dating, that's a great idea uh, to get their brand associated with uh, providing that type of value to the attendees. Um, one thing that we did in the past too that sounded kind of similar was um, we were at the, the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, which has their famous sunset court if anyone's um, familiar with it. They also have the garden court upstairs and it's a really cool like dome space that we had. The brand itself had their like genius bar activation area under the dome and then we had um, individual rooms kind of surrounding that for the, the partner brands and they were able to deck out those rooms within their own brand. So because it was kind of a separate space, um, we felt like we could kind of create that own fully branded experience for the partners as well. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, but then as we're, as we've been transitioning to the online world, it's definitely been challenging, I'll be honest, um, in terms of cr providing that same kind of value and putting together packages that make sense. Uh, the typical, you know, logo on branding, booth space, lead list type of package just doesn't translate as well. Um, you know, it's, we don't have the, the coffee and tea and desserts to, to get everyone <laughs> to get foot traffic for the partners. So, you know, we, we use uh, strategies like gamification to try and drive booth traffic for sponsors online. Um, but again, I think that it's become even more clear that we need to be more creative about how we're incorporating sponsors into our events. Um, and that is something that we will take, I think, from the digital world. Uh, into our in-person events as well, that maybe that format, uh, that typical sponsorship format isn't always the best answer. Um, so I think that's something that we'll be, that we'll be taking for sure. And um, just kind of advising our clients to, to rethink those strategies going forward. Great insight, thank you so much. Um, okay, so up to this point, I've gone fairly gentle on the panel and, and the audience. Should we get a little bit tougher in a little media? Yeah, get a little bit tougher in a little media. Thanks for that feedback. I'm really missing the audience, can you tell? Okay, we've been talking about one type of braiding point. We've been exploring braiding our understanding of the past with the realities of the future towards what we want to achieve in the future, okay? I want to talk about another braiding point that we like to explore in the Event Design Collective, and that is braiding our understanding um, of where we sit within the process and with our team through the development of an event. You're part of a process that is the coming together of many different threads, many different perspectives, many different ideas, needs, and wants many of which uh, uh, predated your involvement within the event, and many of which will continue on after your contributions. Navigating this braiding point of different perspectives, and you've heard them all up until this point in the conversation, it's challenging because they are firmly based in human behavior. I would like to explore with the ladies some pivotal experiences that they have had that focus on how they address change with the teams that they were working with. And how do they address new threads that are introduced? Catherine, to kick us off, can you provide some insights how you addressed changes with your vendors, suppliers, and other relationships? Uh, for example, when you moved to the conference from California to Vancouver, how did you approach taking the whole team through the necessary change that was linked to that? Right, uh, it was a big change. Now, when you move a conference from Monterey to Los Angeles, that's one thing, you're in a new venue. When you move it from uh, Los Angeles or Long Beach, as the case was, to Vancouver, you're changing countries. For the very first time, our attendees were going to require a passport to attend TED. They had to get across that border. But in addition to that, we had to create new relationships um, we, we had been working with a plethora of U.S. national vendors, local vendors, and they'd been part of TED for 29 years. And in our 30th year in Vancouver, we're crossing a border into Canada, and Canadian vendors, the, the, the starting point was, what is TED? They, the, we had to actually educate them what the conference was because it did not have the same brand recognition 
as it did in the United States. So, the, so the, really, that became the starting point. Um, but it also had become very clear to me that we had outgrown our technical vendor. And I say that with the greatest of respect to them. They helped produce um, probably in the neighborhood of about 30 conferences, uh, the same technical vendor. And um, so in year two of being in Vancouver, and I had been thinking about this for a while, I had been championing a thought process with Chris where we would actually grab the reins back and hire our own technical team instead of using a technical provider. That meant a couple of things. First of all, I had been on headset with the technical team helping um, manage the room and the stage right from the very first conference. You have to know technical as an event producer. I cannot say that clearly enough or as many times as I need to. And you need to understand it from the bottom up. Every position, what they do, and why they're there. And once you know that and you can make sense of that technical world, it allows you to free think about what and dream about what the possibilities could be. And so in year two, um, I hired a technical director got Chris's buy-in and hired a technical director and we went to work hiring 130 local crew in Canada and in Vancouver to produce the conference. And it is a very rigorous process that Ted uses for the back end behind the scenes. And so everybody had, regardless of whether you're a stage manager or a stage hand or a, or a shader, you had to relearn the TED way. And so we had an enormous job doing just that. Now we're in a new venue. We've got to relearn the venue. We've got to uh, floor plan that venue and, and make sure that we get it right because we were moving into a larger venue and we still wanted intimacy while um, ha being housed in a larger space. Um, we were bringing on a new technical team um, and, of course, we needed build partners. We needed creative brand design partners for sponsors. Um, and it allowed us a lot. Of, well, first of all, it was a ton of work. We RFP'd every single service that we needed. Um, but it also allowed us to, once again, be exposed to new people, new ideas, and collaborate and, and redesign. Um, and so uh, it was exciting. It was, it was really exciting. Um, building a broadcast style, a TV broadcast style technical team requires special expertise and, and I have to say, I mean, I really couldn't have done that without having an exceptional TD in place um, who I'm very fond of and thank from the bottom of my heart for all his hard work. Uh, and uh, so... Um, the other part of that was, and this was the big thing, is that we had Steelcase as a long partner. They were our furniture partner. They helped design the social spaces as well. And that floor planning is arduous. Uh, it is a long process. It's a very detailed process. And um, they would give us their furniture and a designer and then I would sort of allocate where things were going to go and we would get to work and design that. Well, now, of course, they're in the United States. Fortunately, they had a Canadian arm, and so we were able to bring that supplier with us, that partner, um, and as it turns out, uh, their success um, designing with our team uh, the TED environment helped them launch a division of the company where they are now available to all meeting planners and you can hire their services to have them help design the spaces and rent part of their furniture. Uh, and if you've got the budget to do that, it's a great experience and they're a really welcome addition. The, the real cherry in all of the vendor relations was this. We were moving to a new venue that I had been advocating 
for over five years that didn't have a theater. And it took Chris a while to get his head around that. In fact, we passed on Vancouver the first time I suggested it because of the lack of a theater built into the conference center. And I kept saying, we can build our own, we can build our own. It's a really gutsy thing to say that. And it was a huge risk, but it ended up paying off in spades, luckily, because it could have gone the other way. Um, but in so doing, it allowed us to once again, reimagine what the TED conference could be, should be, and how were we going to be restricted not having our own, not having a pre-built theater that is built to spec, right? And so now we get to redesign and recreate it, and that comes risk and, and, and all kinds of issues. And so it was, you know, my job to try and figure out what all of those issues were going to be. And so I brought along a little video um, that I was going to talk through um, to give you some sort of stats on the theater and give you a sort of a bird's eye fly through of the theater and what that um, entails because it was a, it's a mighty thing and it was a scary thing in that first year. But of course, we've grown to love the theater. We've got it down to a fine art and it is warehoused uh, throughout the year. So I'm just going to, um, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so the TED Theater is a solid Douglas fir structure reminiscent of Shakespeare's Globe Theater, which was built for spoken word. The first step was to acoustically model the ballroom that this was going to be built in and figure out if there were audio issues. And I hired Arup, which is a professional acoustic company, and they came back and said, you're going to need to baffle all the walls of this ballroom. So I went into conversations with the Vancouver Convention Center, and under a joint venture, we re-baffled all the walls. Um, the next recommendation was that we needed to permanently add steel girders to the floor of the ballroom, between the ballroom and the trade show floor beneath it, so that it would comfortably hold 330,000 pounds of Douglas fir furniture and people in it. There are 93 main theater components with over 18,000 individual pieces. Each of 62 pie-shaped pieces weighs 2,500 pounds and has to be hand-carried through. The only set of double glass doors at the convention center, and it's got a one-inch margin on either side to squeeze that piece through. And it has to be done 62 times in order to get them all into the building and 62 times on the way out. Um, and so um, we, we set it up. It takes six days to set up. It takes uh, to a couple of days to strike. And it's warehoused the balance of the year. Each year, it's hand sanded before it's reinstalled. So it's hand sanded out at the warehouse, put on semis, 60 semis roll up with each section, and boom, we go at it again each year. Three custom screens are made in Germany, and they are um, floor to ceiling. And, um, and, and this I will mention because it's so worthy of mentioning. The other thing that in addition to building the theater, we innovated on the confidence monitor. And so what you see is, is the theater itself with all the furniture. And we had speakers who were literally standing and looking at a confidence monitor on the ground and being shot in IMAG over their shoulder, so now you're seeing three images of a speaker, and they're all looking at the ground, looking at their notes. And so we took that and put our 80-inch confidence monitor, lost 19 seats out of the equation, and stuck it directly in the audience in front of them so that all the 11 cameras that are going on are capturing shots. But as long as that um, speaker can look directly ahead at their notes and refer to them, you do not have that shot anymore, which is super important in a digital world. 
trust me, on TED.com, that's where people notice it the most. It's a little bit distracting in the room to have a speaker look at their notes on the ground, but it's completely different when you're watching it online and they're looking at the ground. And so that was a super important um, uh, innovation that we uh, introduced. And for any of you who are still using confidence monitors on the stage, I would encourage you to try it. Um, the community loved the theater in year one. They still love it. They feel very attached to it and they feel ownership of it because they're the only ones that get to experience it. And so it was a way to give back to the community as much as it was anything else um, and a really good innovation, uh, one of the many over the years. Amazing. And, and, and I think there's a lot of inspiration from um, the, the television broadcast side of things, because that's fairly commonplace to have have scripting and notes up at that eye level. So, so kudos for you picking that up and bringing that in. Uh, Jenna, I'd like to give you the opportunity uh, to speak to this same topic. How have you addressed managing change, perhaps that example, or if you have other examples of how you understand that braiding point of different perspectives as you navigate through change? How do you guide them through that so that you can still get the most out of their contribution and collaboration with those stakeholders? Right. Well, in ways varied and many. In Long Beach, we could activate everything within a two-block radius. And all of a sudden, we were coming to Vancouver, we were more spread out. The increased size of the conference required bigger venues for the off-site events or the evening events. We loved the footprint of the conference center attendant with the proximity to the hotels, but the size of the venues we needed for our events resulted in us holding half of our events at the conference center, which was atypical for us. Um, it meant that we had to innovate with the conference center um, catering team to be able to offer different types of variety. I mean, we all know that if the food is coming out of one kitchen, eventually it starts to taste the same, no matter how much variety you've got in the menu planning. And so to be able to introduce that, we'd always had a formula of bringing in our own partners to our events, um, both food and beverage partners and different types of exhibits. And that was one of the things that we wrote into the contract going into the relationship with the Vancouver Conference Center itself. And we're able to apply that to create that point of difference. The Vancouver Conference Center itself, which is magnificent by anyone's standards, gave us a larger footprint for the program. And we were able to add more elements to fill the space with the excellent Conference Center design of what we called the loop which were the lobby spaces that surrounded our theater. It was so easy for anyone to leave the theater on the north side or the west side or the south side and immediately start a journey around the loop, which meant that we could plan our activations on all four sides and know that they would be well attended. Vancouver is a gorgeous city with a varied and sophisticated array of restaurants and chefs, which enticed more private events to start picking away at the program timing and competing with our own events, which we worked really hard, I specifically worked very hard with the community to minimize that impact. And I had private conversations with all of those people that were holding events to try and get them to put their event on the one free night that we were doing or at least to ask them about their timing. And I had a very nice relationship with the community that I could go back and they would respect my position and I would respect theirs. And we'd work together to minimize that impact. But it was, it was significant to us over the years, not to mention all the shops and other attractions and things that were drawing people away. Um, when the conference was in our other locations, the smaller locations, it was more homogenous because everyone attended the events and there wasn't as many things that would draw them outside and they wanted to be with each other so they were together from morning till night even into the late night events. We had a vibrant local community here in Vancouver and we engaged local captains of industry to get them involved in TED which opened doors for new programmatic events. It was a buried treasure of pre-conference activities to showcase amazing innovation new speakers, venues, partners, everything. Having that cadre of local business people, including the civic government, has been invaluable. 
And I will just say that that um, one of the other things that we did was Steelcase, who had been such an amazing partner and such a like the best partner you could ever want, um, had been building out a business center for us in our other locations. But when we came here, we had the space to be able to offer them a good part of the second floor, and they built out a beautiful um, center, which was uh, what we called our workspace, um, work, uh, sorry, work spring space. And the work spring space was all small rooms where we activated private lunches and different types of meetings, and you could book a space there and hold a private meeting. So if you think about an airline um, uh, lounge out at the airport with the private meeting rooms, it was amped up and that much greater. And we did all the catering and we had all sorts of private events up there. So we really were able to cater to people. And the one last point I'll make is that in getting all of our vendors prepared for that shift, we actually had um, a series of um, meetings and tours of the venues, but also we brought in all of our partners and all of our potential partners who were looking at partnering in Vancouver, and we brought them on site inspections in advance so that they could see exactly what the setup was, and it got them super excited. We spent three days with them going through everything and all of the dinners in, in the evening were centered around how we could activate. And it was really an exciting time for everybody. Wow. Um, super inspirational stuff, I'm sure. And all the MPI members are taking a lot out of this. Uh, Chrissy, we, we are starting to run out of time, like all good live television. <laughs> but quickly, can I, I please ask you to, to, you know, the same sort of question. How have you addressed some of the changes that have happened recently and some of the coming changes with your team and managed the roles and that braiding point between the different responsibilities and how to navigate that change? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it really does come back to, for us, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll keep this brief, but the the theme of everything has changed but nothing is different i feel like what we've done is we kind of just think of the venue as the virtual event platform now so if, in framing it that way within our team um, as we're working with clients and as we're working with vendors um, we're kind of using a lot of the same processes we have different task lists or tasks on the task list um, but if we just frame it that way as you know the venue is the virtual event platform now. Um, that's kind of helped us, uh, you know, get through that change and just have the confidence that we, you know, we're event planners, we're, sol we're problem solvers. If we kind of just look at it that way, um, we've been able to be successful in um, just solving those problems in the same way we would for an on-site event just in the digital world now. Um, so that'll, that's my short version of that answer. <laughs> A fan, fantastic response, super succinct, love it. Now to close this part Great. out and move us into the next section <laughs> where we're going to talk tech, uh, I'd like to play a game with this panel. Now, this wasn't in the original script, so I apologize if it catches you off guard. Uh, this game's called Many Things to Many People. I like to call it Fighting Fear with One Sentence. Ladies, I would like you each to finish the following statement for me. I'm not scared of hybrid because dot, 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 fill in the blank. I'll give you an example. I'm not scared of hybrid because it's just another design challenge looking to be solved. Uh, if you're up for it, Janet, can you, can you share yours with us? I'm not scared of hybrid because necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. Catherine, what do you got for us? I'm not scared of hybrid because we just eclipsed 10 years of growth with uh, digital in a single year because of the pandemic, and we are on the cusp of new, innovative things that are coming at us, and it's going to come so fast. It's exciting. Yeah. Brilliant. Chrissy, give us, give us yours. You're not scared of hybrid. <laughs> All right, same vein. So I'm not scared of hybrid because it's just uh, another opportunity. And with every opportunity, there's growth. And uh, if you're not growing, you're dying. So I'm here for it. I'm here for hybrid. Mm -hmm. Good. 
good fun. Amazing. Thank you so much, ladies. I'm going to ask you to stick around for some. Uh, I don't think we're going to have much time for questions, but please stick around. We'll see if we can have some time. Um, Chrissy, before we go, though, can I just ask you, your venue down there looks super cool. Um, can, can you give us a bit of an insight? Where are you? What's going on down there? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'll give you a quick look. Um, so I'm downtown in downtown LA right now. And the space that I'm in is called the Awa Oasia. Um, it's a really cool space. It's like a converted warehouse type feel that you could use for a number of different types of events. Um, I would imagine it if you're, say, doing a user conference downtown at the Intercontinental or the Sheraton. This is a quick drive. You could do a really cool after party or sponsor activation here. Um, really neat space, very flexible. Uh, but you could even host the meeting itself here. Uh, so pretty neat. Very cool. I mean, those pictures just look amazing. I cannot wait to get back down to LA. Okay, let's, uh, let's now, let's get our tech geek emojis out. Let's get geeky as, uh, and let's explore the technology side of what's going on here with Daniel and Peter. Uh, to get us started, let's look at the great space there uh, in Vancouver. I'm gonna invite Daniel Sabina from Showmax Events. Welcome, can you share with us what you've got going on at the Rocky Mountain Rail Station? Great, thanks very much, Anthony, and welcome everybody to this presentation. So once again, I'm Daniel Sabina from Showmax Events, and we're here at the lovely Rocky Mountaineer train station. On behalf of uh, MPI and the BC chapter, we're really happy to be a proud sponsor. So what we have here at Rocky Mountaineer is functionally a South Hall and a North Hall. The South Hall is approximately 75 by 75, and the North Hall is 150 by 50. We've outlined and installed over $1 million worth of event technology into the venue. And it's created this uh, basically a walk-in ready event space for event producers, meeting planners, and we can service all types of, type, all types of events. So uh, it's our partners, BC Event Management, and also Rocky Mountain near train stations Vancouver that have come together to create this event space. So we're looking forward to hybrid events. We're also looking forward to doing virtual events right now. And once again, we really appreciate everything that's, uh, that's happened in this opportunity to showcase what we're up to. Thanks, Daniel. I, I gotta tell you, that's one of my favorite venues in Vancouver, if not Canada. I've, I've done a bunch of shows there over the years. So yeah, everybody in Vancouver, if you haven't checked out the Rocky Mountain Rail Station, hadn't run an event there, get down there, connect with BC Event Management and show, show Max and check it out because that is a very versatile space, really worth checking out. Uh, let's get uh, some questions. Please put your questions in to, uh, for, for Dan around the venue. We may not have time to address them here and now, but we're going to follow up with as many of the questions as we can after this event. Uh, and for now, I would like to welcome Peter Young from Hubcast uh, Media International. Uh, Peter, can you, can you uh, give us a bit of an insight into this tech that we're working with? I'm loving the tech. Can you share what makes Hubcast so unique? Well, thank you, and uh, thanks, Anthony. Uh, uh, we're actually in our Studio A right now. We're actually hosting this uh, the stream today and bringing our studios in from Toronto and LA. And and uh, actually, we're what would be considered uh, the next generation of, of media broadcast technology companies. And what that really means is, as we're working with um, with uh, uh, with event producers, they all have different scale of of access to technology. Uh, a venue like uh, like a Rocky Mountain Rail Station which has this amazing technology that Dan's put together with Showmax, isn't always available to everybody in the world. And in fact, uh, people are sometimes limited to one or two inputs, or in, in fact, their Skype uh, connection uh, is really what they're allowing them to do virtual events. So what we do is we're working, we're a, a technology company. We work with all aspects of, of, uh, of both broadcast terrestrial, the CBCs and the CTVs, the world of in Canada, uh, right down to um, uh, Zoom and, and all the different platforms, uh, as well as we innovate uh, beyond that to find custom solutions for our customers as well. So we use a, a technology we developed, it's called Hubcasting. It allows us to put our technology into any venues that have network connectivity. Uh, right now in uh, our Oasia, which we produce, uh, produced, the, I guess two years ago, the, uh, the World uh, um, um, Global Peace Song Awards down there, uh, again, an amazing venue, and 
as I say, uh, uh, Oasia is a, a space that is very unique because they have a, a bunch of different places around the, the, the facility that we can really uh, customize the event as the, as the experiences. But also our studio in Toronto, which is a, uh, another small space that uh, Anthony, you're out of there and, uh, and using our technology out of that space as well. So really what we do is we're, we're an ecosystem. We allow uh, people to connect their, uh, their content and their, their production to, to multiple locations. And, uh, I, and the best thing to do is, is check out our website, hubcastmedia.com. Uh, it talks about the projects we're involved. We, we do everything from uh, uh, large scale sports broadcasting right down to hybrid events and what we call Produce Zoom, which is what we're doing today. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, I've got the official word from the producers in, in the studio that I have used up all of the time for questions as I so often do. I apologize to all the viewers out there who have questions, but keep them coming in. We will certainly follow up with you after the event. Uh, that does definitely bring us to time for our master series conversation today. I encourage you to connect with the content and each other on social media. Explore the idea of braiding points. Understand your past, what needs to happen in the present in order to design and direct the future. And articulate and communicate your braiding points with your team over time throughout the event design process. To that point, make sure you have a process and communicate it effectively with your team. Of course, if you want to explore these types of conversations or how events are catalysts for change and must be highly valued by the business world, I've got a collective for you. Our movement of event designers using the Event Canvas is growing rapidly in North America and we would love to have you join us on the journey. Designing with intention and purpose should be a fundamental part of every event. If you find it challenging and would like a visual tool and a three-phase methodology, reach out to me to start a conversation. Hashtag Event Canvas, hashtag Make Change Happen. Now with that, I'm going to thank you for this official part and I'm going to welcome to the virtual stage the president of MPI British Columbia chapter and one of my favorite educators, David Tacannon. <laughs>